Welcome to Cancer Newsline, your source for news on cancer research, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. I'm your host, Dr. Oliver Bogle. Dr. Gershenwald, what's the incidence of skin cancer or melanoma um, in the U.S., and is it rising? Over 80,000 patients, will, individuals will be expected to be diagnosed with melanoma this year. It's the fifth and seventh most common cancer of, of those that we actually measure in the U.S. And unlike many other cancers where the incidence is either stable or has been decreasing over the last years to decades, in melanoma, the incidence continues to increase probably about 3% a year. What's the reason for that increase? So we're not exactly sure, but one of the areas of concern clearly over the last few decades has been lifestyle. Uh, as we've learned over the decades that uh, enjoying the outdoors and exercising and staying fit is important for health, which it clearly is, um, there are other um, unintended consequences, if you will, at some times, like overexposure um, to the ultraviolet radiation from the sun. And we also know that indoor tanning is a big risk factor, too. So you've been quite involved in, in prevention strategies uh, regarding ultraviolet light exposure. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on? Sure. Back about uh, four or five years ago, when uh, here at MD Anderson, we had an opportunity to converge our thoughts across uh, clinical disciplines and um, think about what are the unmet needs. One of the things that we realized is that we had a lot of the information um, really at our hands on uh, risks of, of melanoma and skin cancer. And we recognized that we actually had some tools to prevent it as well. So knowing that overexposure from the sun or any use of indoor tanning, regardless of the number of times, and we know that the more times, the higher the risk, we were able to come together as a group of clinicians and researchers, basic scientists, advocates, patients sharing their journey, and uh, our government relations team and other stakeholders. And we shared these lessons learned. We shared the data with stakeholders, and um, we actually um, met with uh, our state representatives and recognized that there was an opportunity here to protect uh, the health of our youth, just like kids need to wear seat belts and can't drink alcohol, and um, uh, why not be protected from the, the health dangers of overexposure to the sun? And so um, with um, um, those forces um, together, um, the Texas legislature was the fourth state in the country to uh, pass indoor tanning legislation that would ban minors from indoor tanning. Um, since that time, that was back in 2013, um, uh, two states uh, previously had uh, uh, been uh, in that space uh, at the end of 2012, and fast forward to 2017, now a third of the country, 17 states plus the District of Columbia, have banned indoor tanning. Fantastic progress. What would your advice be to our listeners regarding how they should manage their sun exposure? So I think you need to respect the sun. For those of you who live in, in Texas and in the South, uh, the sun is part of our, our daily culture. And uh, there are many health benefits to being outside, um, but protect yourself. So try to minimize the midday exposure, you know, generally from uh, 10 to 4, uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, use a, a broad spectrum uh, sunscreen, reapply it regularly, particularly if you're swimming or, or perspiring quite a bit. Um, wear a wide brim hat, wear sunglasses protect your skin and, and try to think about um, activities that don't require sun exposure in the midday. So when you have lunch, try to seek some shade. So in addition to preventing exposure to sun, finding skin cancers early is important. Is that correct? The earlier you find them, the better you can deal with them. Uh, for sure. Uh, an early detection uh, from the standpoint of an individual at risk includes both melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancer. Uh, interestingly, non-melanoma skin cancer, and many of you may have heard of basal cell or squamous cell uh, cancers, arise from uh, cells in the skin that don't give rise to melanoma but are much, much more common. Fortunately, they're readily treatable, often treatable um, locally. Um, but we also know that um, melanoma, while in advanced stages, can be um, um, uh, quite challenging uh, to treat. Early detection is associated with a really favorable prognosis and outcome. And so um, for those um, uh, uh, patients who ultimately develop melanoma, early diagnosis can, uh, is very associated um, with uh, uh, better outcomes. So part of the challenge of uh, accurately identifying early stage melanomas, I guess, is knowing what you're looking at. And there's been some recent advances that you've uh, written about in this, in this space uh, using technology. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on? Sure. So, you know, one of the big challenges is it's hard to know um, exactly what a suspicious lesion looks like. And so experience matters. And so um, uh, while expert dermatologists can use uh, not only a physical exam and their own um, uh, expertise, they can use uh, additional tools 
uh, uh, one called dermoscopy, which is a, uh, a camera-like device that helps to enhance um, the image of a suspicious mole or nevus. Um, but moving beyond that, since most people who are diagnosed with melanoma don't have the luxury necessarily of even um, uh, being consulted by an expert dermatologist if they live in rural communities where uh, physicians may be few and far between, uh, technology may be an answer. Uh, and so uh, in a really interesting uh, set of uh, studies um, out of uh, Stanford, um, a group of uh, computer experts actually used uh, uh, advanced um, uh, uh, computer algorithms um, to examine over 100,000 images from the skin, many of which uh, were melanoma tumors, and were able to refine their ability to identify melanoma, sort of the needle in the haystack, if you will, um, as well as expert dermatologists when ultimately compared head to head. And so uh, if this technology can be uh, accelerated and, and really perfected so we know exactly how to use it and how individuals who might be exposed to this kind of technology um, can actually get care, then we might be able to really make a dent in, in um, improving um, diagnosis for those who are not close to experts. Sounds like a great advance. Uh, finally, um, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on in, in the new therapy development for melanoma? What, what's, what are you most excited about uh, in that area? So really uh, tremendously exciting and unprecedented times in, in the treatment arena for melanoma. What we've learned over the last several years is that um, there are particular um, genetic changes or mutations in tumors that help to drive um, the underlying machinery to, uh, if you will, um, uh, create an on switch for melanoma in about half of patients with uh, 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 the disease. And we've also learned that the immune system has an important role. And both of these features, understanding the genetic changes as well as understanding um, the immune system, have um, leveraged uh, um, uh, this into a really a new therapeutic armamentarium of uh, treatment options for patients with melanoma. Dr. Gershnawal, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with our listeners. Thanks for having me. For more information, visit mdanderson.org. Thank you for listening to Cancer Newsline. Tune in for the next episode in our series.